Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'll just spend four hours burying the cat. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Four hours to bury the cat? Yes, I wouldn't keep still wriggling about howling. Ooh. And Rish Outfield. Is he very old then? No, we just don't like it. Oh. Hey, that ain't funny, man. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. We are your hosts, and once again, amazingly, we have a story to share with you. It is quite amazingly this time around, to tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, yes, this is a special episode because, well, have we done this before? We had a story that we have written together? No, I don't think we've ever written a story together other than this story. Okay, oh. well, there that's a milestone. And then we also have the producer of this particular episode, Clay Duggar, with us today. Yay! I'm sorry, would you put your father on the phone, please? <laughs> That's Clay, actually, there. <laughs> sorry about that, gentlemen. I was I was leaning back from the microphone at the moment when you decided to introduce me. That's all right. It's called a lack of preparation. <laughs> all right, so yeah, Clay's along for the ride with us today, and uh, we've got, uh, it's, it's quite a long story, and I guess that should be obvious because it was written by Rish and I together who are both blabbermouths. So uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right to the story, and then afterwards we will uh, do some discussion. So the story is called Last Contact by Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich, and it was produced by Clay Duggar. We've got a whole host of folks that did voices for it. We'll do the uh, cast list on the other side. I think that's it. Enjoy? Yeah, enjoy the story. Last Contact by Rish Outfield and B.D. Anklevich. It all happened because Hughes stayed up too late playing Madden football on the PlayStation against Anthony the night before. He was drifting away, the teacher's lecture becoming only a soothing hum. Dude. The hissing whisper nibbled at the edges of Hughes' fog. He tried to ignore it. Dude! The whisper had grown more insistent and came with a poke to his shoulder. She's looking at... Mr. Johnson? Hughes hadn't really been asleep, just dozing lightly enough that when Mrs. Howard called his name, he sat right up. Of course, he overcompensated and knocked his biology textbook right off the desk. Are you here to sleep or are you here to learn? T sorry. But she wasn't satisfied with that. She asked her question again. I said, are you here to sleep, or are you here to learn? I'm here to learn, he said, looking around for his pen. It seemed to have disappeared during his brief nap. Good to hear. She pushed her glasses high up on her nose. I'll see if I can't make my class a bit more exciting for you. We were picking presentation partners during your beauty rest, and I think your partner is going to be Tiffany Other. He blinked. No, I, I... I. He didn't dare look back at the creature two rows over. Just a glance at her chilled his blood. I, I'm partners with Anthony. Anthony already has a partner, Leah Allen. When did this happen? Hughes turned to glare at his friend. Anthony shrugged sheepishly. The teacher continued. Everyone must have a partner, Mr. Johnson. He couldn't argue with that. He just hoped the alien would be okay with doing her half of the presentation on her own. Most people would probably think it was exciting to have an extraterrestrial in their school. And maybe it would have been six years before, when they first landed and presented themselves to us, when everything was new and thrilling and everybody's mind was blown. But later, when it became clear that we hadn't entered a new golden age of technology, that we wouldn't be out zipping among the stars, when all we had was 61,000 new mouths to feed, well, the novelty wore off pretty quick. And it's true that there weren't a lot of others attending public schools. Tiffany, Matthew, and Molly were the children of the foremost alien in America, an ambassador who went to L.A. and Washington every month. And he didn't live in one of the reservations. He felt that it was important for his children to mingle with human children to show us that they weren't monsters. And as he was always stressing in interviews... They had much more in common with us than different. But tell that to anybody who looked at one. 
Their four eyes were bulbous and glassy. They were covered in thick matted hair and their bodies were thinner and hunched over like a gorilla. Hence their detractors had started calling them space monkeys or spunkies. They wore human clothes, which didn't fit them well, and had a tiny second set of arms they kept hidden in their shirts, either because there were no sleeves for them or they were trying not to draw attention to the differences. As a species, they were cowardly and submissive. They scurried rather than walked, and they breathed from rat-tailed tubes that served as their noses. Sorry, dude, Anthony said as they gathered their things and headed to their next class. I tried to wake you up, but... Yeah, I know. Too late. Why aren't you tired? I am, but I have a study hall I can sleep in. Hughes sighed. Why couldn't he have passed out in English class? Miss Ferris wasn't as petty as his biology teacher. How am I going to pull off this lab partner thing? Don't worry, man. Now you finally have a chance to do the sex things you've always wanted to do with those tubes on Tiffany's mouth. You can write your report on what that felt like. Hey, you can do your report on what death feels like, Hughes said and punched him in the shoulder. Anthony peeled off and headed to his world history class as Hughes trudged silently to his P.E. class. Not only was Hughes paired with that four-eyed hairy freak, but Anthony had been paired with Leah Allen. Hughes had had his eyes on Leah for months now, ever since he'd broken up with his old girlfriend, Sienna. He thought he'd been making progress, but he also knew that Anthony was his main competition. Anthony was probably planning his best moves for their next biology lab, while Hughes would be busy struggling not to vomit all over his partner. Damn those interminable slideshows and the dim, sleep-inducing lighting they were shown in. They had arrived August 8th, what the vast majority of Americans referred to as the dreaded O-Day. They arrived in seven big ships, one on each continent and two in Africa. For 32 hours, the ships just sat there, drawing crowds and worry. And then how the aliens had poured out. These were refugee ships from a far-off planet they called 426. Faced with proof of life outside our solar system, suddenly a strange, uneasy peace spread across the Earth as people realized that skin color, caste, and differing depictions of God no longer mattered when confronted with actual monsters, with a true other. Tiffany's father had started in Texas, where the North American ship had landed, then moved to Los Angeles, although not voluntarily, then to Seattle, also not voluntarily, and was now here in Mesa, Arizona. The aliens, you see, weren't welcome in big cities, and their numbers had thinned from almost 20,000 original others in America to just a few groups here and there living on lands designated for their use, unsuitable for anything else. Hence, most of America's others lived in Arizona, Nevada, and a corner of New Mexico. School finally ended, and Hughes joined Anthony at his locker. As they started to the parking lot, Leah approached them. Hey, Hughes. Hey, Leah. Are you ready to go? Hughes realized after a long second that she wasn't talking to him. Yeah. Leah fell into step beside Anthony, and they moved through the doors to the student lot. Suspicious, Hughes followed. On the stairs, Anthony paused as if just remembering something. I'm sorry, dude. I told Leah I'd give her a ride home, and she lives in the complete opposite direction from you. So? So I kind of got to be to work by four, so... Sorry. Leah chimed in, and they went down the stairs together. What had just happened? With absolutely no spring in his step, Hughes went around the school to where the big yellow buses were lined up. He had gone home with Anthony for so long it was hard to figure out which bus was the one that went by his house, but he found it and headed for an empty seat toward the back. He slumped on the cracked leather seat, reflecting on how Mrs. Howard had doubly screwed him today. He and Leah Allen hadn't exactly been an item, but they'd been a hair's breadth away from it. Now, if Anthony said or did just the right thing, the ball would swing into his court and they'd be going together by the end of spring. He heard the students chattering go from loud to quiet around him, but didn't care what they were up to. Most of the kids on the bus were younger than Hughes, and if not, 
were poor and without a car. Like him, he supposed. May I sit here? A girl asked, and Hughes shrugged, still hanging his head in frustration. As the girl sat down, Hughes looked up with a start. It was Tiffany, his new biology partner. Tiffany Other, the alien. Hello again, Hughes. And though he couldn't see it in her odd, ugly face, it sounded like there was a smile in her voice. Should he answer? He couldn't even make himself look at her for more than a moment, let alone talk to her. People said spunky smelled bad and carried diseases. He didn't smell anything, but he wondered if he could catch something being this close to her. The silence stretched out and Hughes was starting to feel that it might last the whole bus ride when she spoke again. Do you like butterflies? Stupid alien. She didn't seem to know the difference between boys and girls. No, Hughes said as politely as he could. Butterflies are kind of a girl thing. They're only... She shook her head. It made her fur flip back and forth like a dog trying to dry itself. Oh, sorry. I was confused. You mean that girls are the gender that likes butterflies? I guess I can see that. I just think they're so beautiful. There's so many different kinds of them. Dozens of colors. And the way they flit around on the breeze. I wish I could fly like they do. Yeah, Hughes said, looking away. Okay, well, what about cockroaches? Do you like cockroaches? Those are more boy-like things, right? He answered without even thinking. Ew, cockroaches? Those are disgusting. They're all dirty and full of germs and stuff. Boys don't like cockroaches. No one does. I like them. They're quick and strong, and they can go anywhere. They may not be the biggest animal out there, but they endure anything. No matter how much you try to squash them, they always come back. You can't drive them all out. I wish we were more like that. Oh, and some cockroaches can fly, too. You're kidding. Had he heard of flying cockroaches before? Maybe somewhere on TV? Did you know that a cockroach can live for 24 days without its head? Really? Then they starve to death. Survivors like that amaze me. That's interesting. I never thought of cockroaches that way. I mostly just think they're gross. He hoped she took the hint he wanted to be left alone. Well, there's always more than gross to most things. Do you like snakes? They're gross, but they're also neat, right? Yeah, I like snakes. They're pretty neat. I'm a little scared of them, too, though, because a lot of them are poisonous. I like the way they move. They don't have any arms or legs, but they slither back and forth across the ground and manage to catch animals that should be able to run away from them. She was still talking. In class, Tiffany had never raised her hand, not ever. She knew the answer any time she was called on, but was otherwise silent. This was a new side to her. I have six limbs, but my people never adapted to use them as well as snakes live with no limbs at all. Huh. Hughes grunted in response. I guess that stuff is kind of boring to you. Not for me, though, because I spent my whole life cooped up in the tin can. It's all new to me. Hughes looked out the bus window and tried to imagine what it would be like coming to Earth from somewhere else. What would matter most to him then? It surely wouldn't be basketball, he supposed, like it was now. Maybe he would dig butterflies a lot more. I'm glad Mrs. Howard made us partners. I think it will be fun. Yeah. What should our written report be on? I don't care. Pick the cockroach if you like them so much. All right. Sounds like a plan. And for our class presentation? Hughes continued to stare out the window, ignoring her. Then he felt a tickling sensation on his neck, like a bug was crawling there. Then a soft weight settled on his shoulder. Hughes? Tiffany said plaintively. 
Oh, God. She was touching him. No wonder his skin was crawling. Hughes flinched away, sliding over on the seat until his back was pressed against the side of the bus. He looked at Tiffany's disgusting face, fearfully, eyes wide, breathing heavy. Tiffany turned away and put her head in her hands. Hughes stared at her for a moment longer. Then, when he felt confident that she wouldn't touch him again, he turned back to the window and continued staring out. The bus ride went on for several minutes like this, and then Hughes heard a sound from Tiffany that he would have sworn was a sob. Could others cry? Did those four buggy black eyes make tears? Geez, he didn't even want to know. The bus came to a halt and the door shushed open. This stop was in perhaps the worst part of town, and Hughes was glad that he and his mom no longer lived here. Please don't hate me, Hughes. I'll make sure you get an A. You won't even have to do any work. Just please don't hate me. Then there was a rustle of backpack and hair, and Tiffany was scurrying down the aisle and exiting the bus. Hughes watched her cross the street and head into her building. He was shocked. That's where the other ambassador lived? It was a run-down, dirty slum apartment. What must the conditions in the reservation look like then? Hughes was suddenly overcome with shame at the way he'd acted when Tiffany had touched his shoulder. Her life was surely already difficult enough without being shunned by every human she knew. What kind of an asshole was he? On the rest of the ride home, Hughes thought about Salim, the Pakistani kid he'd ostracized years ago, and how he came to understand his cruelty when he moved to a new school and found himself on the receiving end. He'd regretted his treatment of Salim for a long time, but he'd done the same to Tiffany, and for the same reason. Well, a much more extreme version, but his resentment of Salim had also been because he was different. But here he was, doing it again. Tiffany was weird, but she was definitely nice, and not a lot of people were nice. It was possible that Tiffany Other was a person, just like Salim was. If so, maybe he could at least try to make her feel more accepted, more human than he had done, than everyone had done so far. The other's world was far away. So far, it had taken years for them to get here. Their planet had two indigenous sentient species on it, and the aliens now on Earth had apparently been the weaker, lesser race. For centuries, they had been subjugated, mistreated, and despised. Then one day, they were loaded into several spacecraft and sent into the stars to look for a new home. Luckily, Earth had been there with breathable air and plenty of resources, food, and space. To the others, it was a paradise, a new beginning. To the humans, it was already overfull and overtaxed. And when the others claimed to have little in the way of technology and wonders, the resentment grew. The Alpha aliens on their world had built the ships and knew the secrets of the universe, while the others had worked in factories and mines and hatcheries. Then what use are they? asked the ones who took their word for it. They're lying, the non-believers said, saving their secrets for when they can use them against us. Either way, the others became increasingly unpopular. Because of their already submissive nature, they did little to diffuse anger and assuage fears, essentially doing nothing to prevent history from repeating itself. The next day, Hughes caught a ride to school from his older brother, who worked only five minutes from East Mesa High. He came in the student entrance just in time to see his best friend Anthony holding hands with Leah Allen. Wow, they moved fast. Not only had Leah kicked him to the curb, but he highly doubted Anthony would want to be lab partners anymore. Hughes trudged to his locker and found something stuck into the opening. It was a typed three-page report on the life cycle of the Periplaneta Americana, the common American cockroach. It was credited to Hughes Johnson and Tiffany Other. Attached was a post-it note reading, Let me know if you want any changes. I'm sorry. T.O. The paper wasn't due until next week, but here it was, plus an apology. Hughes didn't know what class Tiffany had for homeroom, but he figured he could find her easily enough at lunch. She sat alone at her own table in the atrium, 
an outdoor eating area with plants, a fountain, and lots of vegetation, where kids sometimes smoked undetected. Sure enough, a couple of stoner types were puffing away in the atrium, while a third kept lookout. Uh, is Tiffany Other out here? Who? The alien girl. No, nah, we chased her off at the beginning of the school year. She don't bother us here anymore. He didn't see Tiffany that day, but with Anthony practically attached to Leah, it looked like he'd be riding the bus home again. He climbed on board, scanning the faces of the mostly underclassmen in the seats, and decided Tiffany must have skipped school that day. But there she was, hunkered down in the very back seat, only the top of her furry head visible from his position. He went straight to the back of the bus and sat down next to her. She shrank down even further in the seat. Did you get the... Yes, I did, thanks. You don't usually ride the bus. No, I have a friend who... He imagined Anthony and Leah cuddling together in Anthony's Mustang and gritted his teeth. Never mind. Why is it you ride the bus? To get to and from school. No, I mean... I think you'd have a driver or something. My father doesn't believe in it. He wants people to think we are like you. Good luck with that, he said without thinking. But it didn't seem to bother Tiffany any. She looked out the window as the bus, finally full, began to move. Hughes tried to think of what to talk to her about, maybe ask her what classes she liked, her favorite color, about her family, the movies she watched, if others watched human movies. After a moment, he came up with something. Do you listen to music? Hughes asked, opening his backpack and retrieving his iPod. Me? Yeah, you. Sometimes. He turned the iPod on and scanned his playlists. As far as he knew, there were no alien singers or bands with others in them. Uh, what do you like? I like it all. He didn't think that was the truth, more like her way of not saying anything that would create conflict. He turned on his Beatles playlist and handed the headphones to Tiffany. Here, check this out. She took the headphones and thanked him, but did not put them on. Very nice. No, you're supposed to listen to the song. You don't mind? It chafed him to listen to her submissiveness, but then he wondered about her furry ears and if he should be sharing headphones with her. Deciding that was a typically ugly American way of thinking, he pushed the thought away. Sure, t take a listen. She did so. Ah. This is what my dad used to like. After he died, I sort of forced myself to like it too. She took the headphones off. Your father has passed away? Yeah, when I was six. I don't really remember him all that much, but when I hear his music... I remember more, you know? Her four eyes went wider. He wrote this music? No, the Beatles did. This is insect music? The, the Beatles were a band a long time ago. My dad was a huge fan of them. Here, listen to this one. My aunt sang this at my dad's funeral. She listened to the whole track of Let It Be. This music is sad. Yeah, but in a good way. Our people used to have songs, but... She glanced up. The bus was stopping at the tenement apartments up ahead. This is my stop. She handed him the iPod and stood up. He had no choice but to stand up as well to let her through. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. He grabbed a sheet of notebook paper and scrawled his cell phone number on it. He handed it to her. Here's my number. Give me a call if you ever feel like talking about beetles or butterflies. Thank you, Hughes. This is the first number I've gotten from a human. That's really cool. A couple other students that lived nearby got up to go. Well, I'll see you. Yes, thank you again. Hughes realized he was sorry to see her go. He had so many questions. He was amazed he'd never taken advantage of having an honest-to-goodness alien in his school. Maybe he'd been afraid. Maybe he'd just been ignorant like all those people that preached that others were demons, or the hippies who chanted, 
Spunkies, pack your trunkies, outside reservation borders. He glanced around at the other kids on the bus. Most of them had their heads down, texting or listening to music or watching videos on their phones. Hughes surprised himself by standing up again. He headed to the front of the bus, getting out before the doors closed, and ran up to join Tiffany. Hey, have you ever flown a kite? Hughes hadn't flown a kite in years, but spring was on the way and all the stores were selling them. The corner gas station didn't have a great selection. He'd wanted to get one that would really excite Tiffany, but had to settle for second best. It had Wonder Woman on it rather than a butterfly, but oh well. There was a field where the Mexican kids played soccer right beside the woods. It was perfect for flying a kite. Tiffany made a yippy whine when the wind took it and it soared up 50 feet in a couple of seconds. It's all right. It's supposed to do that. No, I... That's just my laugh. Feels like spring, he said, changing the subject. I like the spring, she said, but she still sounded embarrassed. Do you have seasons on your world? I... I don't know. Been a long time? Yes. Like you said about your dead father. He processed that for a moment. Do you miss it? My world? (sighs) She growled. No, of course not. That place was not like here. Not a home. But, But people hate you here. Not all people. How could he argue? From the moment they'd arrived, people everywhere had put aside their differences to unify in hatred of the others. None of the old quarrels mattered so much once there were actual monsters living among us. Yet Tiffany insisted on denying the truth. Sure, there were a few people out there who insisted that others were people too, but they were so outnumbered, it was like a million to one. If the others were hanging their hopes on them, they were doomed. Do you want to hold it? Hughes asked, holding the string out to her. Do I? She reached a hand, or paw, out and took the spool of string. So, how does it work, Hughes? What do I do? Well, the string holds it down, and the wind keeps it up. If you want it to go higher, just play out some more line. Oh, I do want it to go higher. May I? Hughes was confused. Why was she asking? Of course. Make it go higher. Tiffany rotated the cheap plastic spool, letting more and more line out. The wind grabbed the kite and pulled it higher into the air, stretching the string taut. Wow! She gasped, and that yippy whining sound burst forth from her again. It was a really strange sound that seemed to have no correlation to the voice she spoke with. When he was younger, Hughes had a cat that would sit at the window and watch the birds cavort outside, desperate to be outside hunting them. In its excitement, it often made strange chirping noises, almost bird-like sounds. Those noises had been almost as incongruous as this sound Tiffany made when excited. She played the line out further and further, and the kite soared higher into the air. You want to be careful not to let out too much... (sighs) As he spoke, Tiffany turned the spool and the wind yanked on the kite. The string was not tied off, and the last bit of string unraveled from the spool, freeing the kite from its mooring. The kite and its line immediately sprang beyond the reach of both of them. Too late. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Hughes. I'm really sorry. Don't don't worry about it. I don't think I ever flew a kite without having to chase it down halfway through. But we can't fly after it. (laughs) Don't worry, it won't go far. The string is what keeps it flying. He pointed at the already steep decline of the kite's flight path. Oh, good. They followed the kite as it drifted into the forested area beside the park. Here it was tall trees, scrubby brush, and a narrow path that wound through it all. Hughes figured it was unlikely that the kite could be salvaged. It was surely stuck in a high branch with its hundred yards of string tangled in dozens of different trees. They walked for a while, searching, and at last Hughes said, You know what? I don't think we're going to find it. It was only five bucks anyway. Let's just call it a loss and move on. Have you ever been in these woods before, Hughes? 
No, I didn't even know they were here. Kind of weird for them to be here in the middle of town. I love them. My father won't let us walk here alone, but he brings us out to enjoy them often. Cool. Was this an unsafe place? It seemed nice enough. Can I show you something? She asked, and his mind went to a dark place. He was in the woods with an alien. Nobody knew they were there. He pushed the thought away. All right. Then she made a noise, not so much with her mouth, but with those tubes where her nose should be. It reminded him of those huge horns they had in Tibet or wherever, only high-pitched. What is that? A call. A call? He heard a rustling in the branches beside him. Oh no, the Earth Firsters were right. But it was a raccoon, a big one, coming out in the open toward them, toward her. He opened his mouth to comment when more rustling came all around him. A varied array of woodland animals moved calmly toward them. Mice, insects, quail, squirrels, even a skunk. Birds flew down from the trees. He thought they would land on her like she was a Disney cartoon, but they just gathered around like it was feeding time at the zoo. Something moved by his feet. It was a snake, a big tan snake with brown diamonds on its back. He shuddered. What is going on? I just thought I'd show you something. Father says humans have no natural affinity with the animals, except for dogs. I... He had no words. The snake stopped slithering right next to a chirping sparrow, but didn't seem to notice that it was there. How long will they stay? I don't know. Till I tell them to go, I suppose. Wow, I'll have to call you for my next hunting trip. Really? I hope you do. I would be glad to accompany you. It was a joke, he said under his breath. I want to experience new things every day, she said, walking around, looking at flowers and budding blossoms, watching the animals watch her. So, just tell me when. She'd taken it as some kind of invitation, like he was asking her out or something. Hughes was mortified, but why should he be? He listened to her voice, babbling about whether hunting was immoral or not, when the world provides such plenty. If he looked away from her, Tiffany sounded almost like a person. People said the others smelled like seaweed or dirty feet, but Tiffany had no smell to speak of, even close to her on the bus. If he closed his eyes, it would be like listening to a human girl, one with an interesting perspective. Hell, if they only looked more like people, he could actually have feelings for her. It was such a crazy thought he didn't hear her finish talking, then ask if he liked the animals. When he didn't answer, she made another high-pitched noise, and the animals slowly dispersed. They were alone again. Is that like hypnosis? No, just a call. Can you do it to people? No. He sensed she wanted to say more. I probably should go back now. I get home from school first, and my father may worry why I'm late. Oh, do you... Do you guys have a car or a bus schedule I can use to get back to my house? Oh, my father will take you home. She turned on her heels and started back toward her apartment. I wouldn't want to bother him. You bother him? But he is another. You are a human. So? So, you know how it is. We are less than you. You ask, we obey. Seriously? He knew she acted that way, but all of them? But he... He's an ambassador, the ambassador for all the Western U.S. For all of America and Mexico now. The ambassador in Louisiana has disappeared. What? Really? When? Eleven days ago. It hadn't even been on the news as far as Hughes knew. What happened? You know. No, I I don't. She ran a hand across her furry neck. 
Let us go see my father. He will be happy to meet you. The apartment complex was dirty, run-down, leaky, and hot. The door to Tiffany's apartment was made of thick steel. It had a deadbolt you would see on the back door of a diamond warehouse. There were dents in the door. Tiffany used her keys, three of them, to gain entrance and asked Hughes to go first. He didn't want to, but stepped in when she wouldn't budge. The apartment was spotless, quite the opposite of the lobby, halls, and staircase. It had two sofas and chairs and tables, all still looking new. There were photos of Earth's wonders on the wall, along with several maps of North America. An other child, male, was at the kitchen table, building something with Legos. He stood when he saw the human, and Hughes shook his head. This is Matthew. Where is Father? He's in our room, Matthew said, gesturing to a closed door. My brother and father share a bedroom. Hughes looked around. There was a kitchen, living room, a bath, and two small bedrooms. Where does your mom sleep? She doesn't sleep. She's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. A man's voice was talking in the room, but Tiffany went to the door and knocked. There was a response in French. Bonjour. We are all learning French this month. He thinks it will be useful. Say, Tiffany. Father, I am here with a friend. A human friend. There was a clatter, and suddenly the door was opened. Is everything all right? He wore a white shirt and tie that fit poorly on his odd body. He stood up straight in an attempt to look less ape-like. Friend? Friend. The ambassador smiled then, bowing his head to Hughes like a geisha in a movie. He looked like Tiffany. They all did, except that much of his fur had turned white and was more short-cropped than Tiffany's. Hello there. Welcome to our home. What can I do for you? I'm... I go to school with your daughter. Yes, of course. Thank you for coming here. Can I get you some celery? Ice cubes, perhaps? Uh, no, thank you. I, um, I was wondering if you could drive me home. I got off the bus with Tiffany, and she was... Of course. I will get my boots on. He went back to his combination bedroom and office. Hughes flew a kite with me. Hughes? From biology class? Oh, thank you for helping my daughter with her report. I liked it very much. I hope I can contribute a little bit more for our next one. Well, we'd better go, said the ambassador, hurrying back into the room and grabbing his keys. I'm expecting a very important call with news on the developments at the United Nations. They all hustled out to the car. The ambassador seemed especially jumpy, head always on a swivel, and leaping into the air with fright when Hughes tripped over a fallen garbage can, creating a small racket. Like Tiffany, the ambassador was very friendly and courteous during the ride, inquiring of Hughes' family, likes and dislikes, and discovering their mutual affinity for classic Jackie Chan movies. The conversation was cut short when the call the ambassador had been waiting for arrived. Hello. He drove with his upper set of limbs and held the cell phone to his ear with one of his two middle limbs. You're not serious. Suddenly, the ambassador, who seemed to take every effort in every facet of his life to be as human-like as possible, downshifted into what must be his native tongue. The chirping, yipping noises were like nothing Hughes had heard before, save the moment that Tiffany had laughed with delight at the kite's flight. Hughes couldn't read his facial expressions, but his voice did sound very tense. He looked over at Tiffany, who looked back at Hughes, and then put her head down in her hands and sobbed. What's going on, Tiffany? What's wrong? They're making us leave again. They're what? Hold on a moment, the ambassador said into the phone. It's this street, right, Hughes? In the commotion, Hughes had forgotten what they were doing. Oh, uh, yes, the, uh, the, the third house there on the left. What's going on? Who's making you leave? No, 
I appreciate the news, the ambassador said into the phone. Let me know as soon as you hear. He hung up and pulled up in front of Hugh's house, shut the car off, got out, and opened Hugh's door for him. It was a pleasure having you in our home, the ambassador said distractedly. If only things could have been different. No problem. Thanks for the ride. He looked at Tiffany. What's going on? Her father stood up straight again, hiding his lower limbs within his shirt. <clears throat> it appears we are no longer welcome here. Th the reservation? Or in Arizona? The alien swallowed. Anywhere. Hughes was confused. What? The UN is voting next Monday. On what? On our deadline to get off the planet. The world's attitude concerning the aliens had been souring for quite some time. The others in India were given their walking papers. The others in America were already mostly on reservations, where tabloid TV shows fabricated lurid behaviors and ghastly secret rituals. In the Middle East, the alien ship was suicide bombed. The others in China stopped communicating one day, and the Chinese government issued a statement that they were no longer a concern. Some insisted an island or neutral territory be made available to them. The Earth First Group's members swelled, and they were loudly demanding the aliens leave, get on their ships, and go. Some of the fringe protesters insisted the others go back to hell. But everyone could agree that Earth was not their home. They had their ships, and they could leave as easily as they had arrived. Mr. Johnson, Miss Other, you're up next. The teacher announced, and Tiffany asked if she could be excused to get their visual aid. She stepped out into the hall, and Mrs. Howard reminded her to bring back the hall pass in the same condition as she found it. Strange, since she'd never said that to even the most delinquent of class members before. Tiffany did not come back for several minutes. The presentation before theirs ended, and it was Hughes' turn. Am I to assume your partner will be taking an F? No, she just... She might be nervous about standing in front of you. I don't know. The teacher tried to gauge whether Hughes was joking or not, and finally said, Well, I suppose she won't really need the grade any more, will she? Why don't you stand up and give your half of the presentation? I will take into consideration your disadvantage. She sounded like she was being magnanimous, but he felt insulted all the same. Hughes stood in front of the class and glanced at the first of his note cards. I chose, uh, we have chosen the North American mule deer for our subject. Its genus is Odocoileus, meaning hollow tooth, and its species is Hemionus, which differentiates it from the deer in other regions of the United States. He glanced to his right, but the door remained closed. It got its name by its large ears, which early settlers suggested looked like a, a mule. This was in uh, 1817, and... Finally, the door opened. It was Tiffany, holding the door open and making another of those odd, trilling noises with her nose. What is she doing? He heard Leah ask. Tiffany? We've all been waiting for you. But the chastisement died on her lips. A fawn walked nervously into the classroom and stopped in front of Hughes. He gave Tiffany a smile, and she closed the door behind her. This, he gestured, is a male fawn... About two or three months old. Two. Hughes nodded and signaled for his partner to continue. It weighs 23 pounds and will grow to approximately 310 pounds. It stands 19 inches in height, but will probably reach 80 inches at adulthood. Their presentation only went on another two minutes or so, but Hughes felt they had done well. Every eye in the class was on the animal, a beautiful, silent creature with blinking brown eyes. And he actually expected a couple of the girls would ask to pet it. 
Instead, people sat still and silent. Tiffany made her call again, and the deer followed her out of the classroom. Oh, my God! shrieked Penny Lomquist on the front row as soon as the door shut. The Spunkies can control our minds? Hughes was shocked. No, I think it only works on animals. And it's not mind control, it's just a sort of call, you know? Like a duck call or something. I can't wait until they get kicked off Earth. They're so creepy and evil. The other kids agreed loudly, and the class descended into a cacophony of outraged chatter. Mrs. Howard took Hughes aside. Where did that come from? The hill behind the football field, I think. Well, I suggest you go out there and make sure that deer is okay. What can I do? Look, just make sure she doesn't kill it. Hughes stepped out into the hall without a hall pass and hurried towards the west exit where Tiffany was leading the deer like the Pied Piper. She saw Hughes coming and waved. She looked happy. He went quickly toward them. A girl was standing on a chair putting up a sign for an upcoming dance and nearly fell off it when she saw the animal and the alien. Eyes on the road, Hughes told her for no good reason. He got to Tiffany's side just as she reached the double doors. Good work. Do you think the teacher liked it? The deer or the presentation? Either one, she said, hope in her oddly shaped eyes. What could he say, that their biology teacher was never going to accept her? She didn't like it, she surmised from his silence. Well, she would have liked it a lot less if it had been about cockroaches. Tiffany laughed. The baby deer looked at her expectantly, like she was its mother. They walked out of the school and toward the football field, the deer in between them. I think we got an A, he said at last, faking a smile. He didn't expect to see her in school on Monday, but she came. There was an assembly, and Tiffany was sitting in a chair by herself right off the stage. Hughes didn't know if that was her choice or not. Certainly, leaving wasn't her choice. March 31st was the deadline the UN had decided. It was ludicrous, since even an apartment eviction notice was longer. But these weren't people, and they had ships that were fueled and ready to go. The United Nations vote had not been unanimous. The U.S. agreed, generously, to give them food and water to take on their journey as long as they agreed to leave before April 1st. The irony of April Fool's Day seemed to have been lost on everyone. Hughes had watched the news account of the meeting. Tiffany's father had reportedly asked the U.N. Council, And if not? To which the response was, Then we would not be so generous. The others responded to the ultimatum, as they typically did, and agreed to go. It struck Hughes as strange that they were so willing to leave if they all liked Earth as much as Tiffany did, but being around her had taught him what little pride they felt as a people, having lived their entire history as second-class citizens. In preparation for the March 31st deadline, Tiffany and her siblings would be taken out of school. This would be her last day. had to hand it to Principal Shermer. After a few announcements, a field hockey game on Thursday, and be sure to buy your tickets for the April Cools dance, he made a show of how lucky they had been to have an other at their school and mentioned Tiffany's exemplary attendance record and grades. In our time together, you and your kind broadened our horizons and opened up a world, worlds even, of possibilities. We're sure you'll do the same wherever the future takes you. There was a smattering of applause, but most of the students were sleeping, whispering, groping the girl next to them, or tweeting on their iPhones. Hughes remembered being told to turn off all electronic devices and show respect when the children's choir from the special school sang at Christmas. No such announcement today. The principal asked if Tiffany would like to say a few words, but she politely declined. Principal Shermer got back in front of the microphone and said, She says, thanks everybody for everything. And thank you, Tiffany. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I tell you, onward and upward. 
The assembly ended, everyone rose and shuffled slowly to their next class, and Principal Shermer took Tiffany to the gym's side. Hughes fought upstream, trying to get close enough to speak with Tiffany, but she was gone long before he got there. He rushed to the office, expecting that she'd be there with the principal, but she was nowhere to be found. As Hughes exited the office door and worked his way through the students hurrying to their next class, he found himself near to tears. It was like a crushing weight every step he took. Finally, he sat down against the far wall beneath a poster for the April Cools dance and put his head down. Until now, confronted with the end of their friendship, Hughes did not realize that Tiffany was this important to him, that he was different than he had been before. He wanted to tell her, but he had no idea if he would ever see her again. Hughes, what are you doing? His buddy and ex-lab partner, Anthony, stood over him, looking concerned. You okay? Hughes nodded, forcing his emotions back inside. Hey, man. Anthony sat down next to him against the wall. What's up? I haven't seen you in a while. Hughes kept his head down, allowing his nose to run to avoid sniffling and cueing Anthony into his tears. He was not in the mood for ribbing, even if it was good-natured, which Anthony was not known for anyway. Aren't you missing your blowjob appointment with Leah? Anthony sighed. Those days are over, I'm afraid. It's cool, though. Turns out you were right that time you said there was a crazy look in her eyes. I was just trying to get a chance with her myself. Well, I did you a favor, man. She was a psycho-jealous bitch anyway. I can't even look at her anymore. Oh. Hughes just wanted to be left alone. He watched Anthony sideways until he looked away, then wiped his eyes dry quickly. I guess I don't have a date to the April Cools dance anymore, though. Sucks, since I already bought tickets. You want them? You going with anyone? No. Hugh said Leah had been the only girl he'd been interested in recently, and that boat had definitely sailed. When it came down to it, the person he wanted to take to the dance was Tiffany. She would love it with the music and the lights and the pretty dresses. It made his mind reel to think like that, but... The person he wanted to be with most wasn't a person at all. As if reading his mind, Anthony said, Looks like you and me get to be lab partners again, huh? Yeah, I guess. So tell me, was it as freaky as hell to be partners with a spunky? Anthony asked, shuddering. No! Hugh said, suddenly angry. It wasn't freaky at all. She's really nice. Nice like ass cancer, right? No. Seriously nice. Whatever. You should have gotten to know her. Oh man, she used that mind control thing on you, didn't she? Like the deer. No, she's really cool, dude. It it was fun being her partner. Anthony squinted at him, then smiled. Oh, I see. You're trying out bestiality on her while you still can. Anthony jumped up and mind doing it doggy style, moaning like a girl in orgasm, then barking like a dog. Rage coursed through Hugh's veins. He leaped to his feet and shoved Anthony hard. Off balance because of his antics, Anthony sprawled out awkwardly onto the linoleum tiles. Oh, what's wrong with you, man? Anthony shouted as he picked himself up off the ground. She's a goddamn alien, not a person. Hughes was already gone as Anthony's complaints and taunts echoed down the hallways. He didn't care what Anthony had to say. He didn't think he could go back to being friends with him again. How could he think that way about Tiffany? How could he not see how great she was? There were still several classes to go, but Hughes walked out the door. He just couldn't be here any longer. Cutting class without Anthony was a lot less worthwhile, Hughes discovered. You can't do much without a car. All he wanted to do was get away somewhere to think, but there was nowhere private near the school. Hughes decided he would walk all the way back to his house. This took him a full hour, and it also gave him a lot of time to think. He found himself a little freaked out with the way he was feeling. He remembered just a few short weeks ago being disgusted at the mere touch of Tiffany's hand on his shoulder, and now he was crying, actually crying, over her leaving. In school, no less. 
in a place where anyone like Anthony could come along and see him. It was practically social suicide, but he just didn't care. In his life, there had been no one like Tiffany, ever. She was interesting and different. She had a vibrancy and a love for life that none of the whatever kids that he went to school with had shared. Unlike everyone he knew, she didn't spend her time with her face buried in her phone, texting, watching YouTube clips, or looking for porn that was shocking enough to still arouse. Instead, she kept her head up, marveling in the world and what it had to offer. Animals and insects and flowering plants amazed and delighted her. There was a time, when Hughes was a child, that he'd felt that way. But he'd moved past that into a better, more grown-up place, he thought. But being with her and feeling her exuberance made him realize that it wasn't better. It was an unhappy place. Being with Tiffany made him happy. And all he wanted to do was be with her. What was he saying, then? Was he in love with Tiffany? Could that even be possible? She was an alien. At the very least, they were not compatible biologically. They couldn't have children together or anything like that. But did Hughes care? He was in high school, for God's sake. Kids were a far future consideration. Were their differences even important? He could be in love with an alien if he wanted, couldn't he? What did it matter, though? He'd probably never see her again. She was off to the stars in just under two weeks, and she'd not be back to school again. He wished that she had given him her phone number as well that day, but since she had never called or texted him, he didn't know what it was. At school the next day, Anthony wouldn't even look at him, which was fine with Hughes. He sat by himself, eating his lunch across the quad from his old group of friends. He was not in the right state of mind to deal with their inane conversation, the sophomoric jokes and immaturity. He'd grown beyond that now. He was worried about more important things. Geez, who did he think he was? One of those emo types who wear all black and think they're so much more adult than all their friends of the same age? Maybe he needed to push all this crap away and resume his life as it had been a few weeks ago. He was about to stand up, go over to Anthony, and apologize for his behavior from the day before when he saw Anthony doing an encore performance of his doggy-style pantomime. Even from across the quad, Hughes could hear the dog barking, which then morphed into a series of Chewbacca-sounding growls and grunts. Forget it. What had he been thinking? Those emo types must actually know something after all. Anthony and the rest of humanity hated the others. Why? Almost none of them had ever met one of them. All the kids in this school had had the chance to meet Tiffany, but instead they had shunned her. He had only become acquainted with her because he'd been forced to. It was too bad that more people weren't forced to do the same. The next week passed slowly. Hughes watched the news every night and searched for AP reports posted on YouTube, anything he could get that would tell him how things were going at the edge of town where the alien's ship was being loaded and prepared for takeoff. He wished that he had a car and could get out there to see it for himself. Maybe he could catch a glimpse of Tiffany. He knew from the news stories that the area was cordoned off and patrolled by the National Guard, what he'd still like to watch from afar. He was often astounded by the viciousness of the protesters surrounding the area. The aliens were already leaving. Why did they have to make this display of hate and anger their final image of mankind? He also wondered why there were no protesters demanding we allow them to stay. Every cause had a minority to object except apparently this one. In no time at all, the day had arrived. This evening, Tiffany and her kind would rise into the sky to never return. His heart, slowly breaking over the past week, was about to be crushed and stomped flat once and for all. Hughes asked his older brother if he could borrow the car, adding that it was an emergency. Dude, every reporter with a news van is in town. Where are you going? There's this girl in school... And I sort of... Say no more. Good luck. As he drove, he imagined the romantic, cinematic reunion they'd have. The swelling music, her crying her eyes out. He found himself smiling, even though he felt awful about what was going on. His brother had been right. Traffic was a mess, even in town. 
More than a mile outside the reservation borders, all vehicles stopped. It took him ten minutes to go two blocks. He could see the bright lights up ahead, but it was so far away. Finally, he pulled the car over into a little dirt arroyo and got out. He jogged towards the reservation, leaving the line of cars behind like they were standing still, which technically they were. It was a media circus around the tall fence that surrounded the other territory. There were many news crews and reporters, even more onlookers and tourists, and an unbelievable amount of picketers and protesters. The Earth Firsters filled the air with homemade signs, outraged shouting, flag waving, and angry chants. They were all outside the fence, unable to get closer. There were entrances on each side, with cordons and National Guardsmen preventing anyone from going in or out. Just beyond the south entrance, the ship could be seen. It was huge and appeared to be constructed out of rough stone, an ugly tank built for durability and efficiency rather than aesthetic beauty. Hughes had seen it once before, when it had been relocated here right after the fence had been built. He remembered the heat that it had put out and the low hum it had produced. It had been crammed full of aliens once, but now would be a lot more roomy, wouldn't it? He got closer. A radio talk show host was there on a makeshift constructed stage with a cadre of supporters singing something that might have been Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. Signs waved for the camera. God has two arms. Get your own planet, ours is taken. And most amusingly, real aliens speak Spanish. He passed a bunch of E.T. Go Home messages waved by children far too young to even get the reference. He passed by them all, finding a small contingent of alien supporters on the other side, holding up signs that said, and justice for all, and one world is enough for all of us, and a family of Asians with signs that said, the real monster above a mirror. The pro-alien group was so small and so sad looking. He knew how they felt. He got up to the front, pushing toward the entrance. People were taking pictures, shoving, filming video, talking into microphones or cell phones and catcalling. No others could be seen anywhere. A National Guardsman, who looked about 12, stood nervously by the nearest cordon, the riot shield in front of him. Hughes called to him. I need to go inside. He was ignored. I need to talk to one of the others. Sorry, the man called. Hughes stood there trying to figure out what to do, occasionally brushed against or actually pushed by the people around him. He considered making a run for it, but there were many guards. An announcement came over many speakers inside the reservation. It was completely indecipherable, and Hughes realized, when it was repeated, that it was in the alien language. A reporter nearby said that there was one hour left and spelled it out for his anchors in the studio. Hughes stood there for a few minutes, bereft, until the cell phone in his pocket vibrated. He pulled it out. It was a text message from Tiffany. Immediately he dialed the number. It rang twice, then her lovely voice asked, Hughes? Tiffany! I, w I wanted to talk to you, but I didn't have your number. He had to strain to hear her. This isn't a very good time, Hughes. That was a laugh. I'm here, at the gate. The one by the ship. I need to see you. I'm sorry. We're loading the last backup cell into the tin can. No one is supposed to leave the ship. Just come out and talk to me for a minute. I... I would like to, but... It's important. It's dangerous, Hughes. Please. There was a lengthy pause. I'll see what I can do. She hung up. He wished he had thought to come before, during the day, when things were calmer, if they ever had been. The reporter beside him was talking. No, their ambassador claims they are all inside the craft now. Any others unaccounted for are not staying by choice. That's what he says, anyway. A couple of Peace Corps volunteers came out of the ship. They were booed, and somebody hurled a can of Campbell's cream of broccoli soup at them. 
They spoke to a guardsman who had a bullhorn, and he yelled, Hughes Johnson. Hughes raised his hand. Go with them, the guardsman said. Hughes pushed his way through the crowd and under one of the sawhorses. Somebody threw something at him. When it hit, he realized it was a bottle of Hunt's ketchup. He ran with the Peace Corps volunteers toward the ship. It had ramps that led into various openings, and he followed them inside. The ship was full of cardboard boxes and plastic containers. The sound of trilling and crying was coming from one of the gray corridors. It didn't look like a spaceship. It looked like a cargo hold of a freighter ship. It was dirty, with rust on the walls and low ceiling, cramped and cold. He did not like it here. Tiffany stepped out and greeted him. She was wearing a pink Hello Kitty t-shirt. Holes had been cut for her secondary arms. Thanks, Cameron, Claire. The Peace Corps folks went elsewhere, leaving them alone. We don't have much time, obviously. Those people, the humans, I mean, they're going to? No, they'll leave before we take off. I had to persuade Father to let you come inside. He's quite fond of you, it turns out. I had to come. I'm so sorry you're leaving. (sighs) Yes, I'm also sorry. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too, she said, but was distracted. I... the the thing is... Shoot, he didn't know how to say this. He started to regret that he'd even come. I... uh, He decided to just blurt it out. I think that I love you. And I had to tell you before you went. Really? Her posture was bad. She looked like an ape again. He ignored this. Yeah. I didn't realize it until you were gone. Going. I love you too, Hughes, but I realized it when you taught me to fly a kite. That gave him pause. There's a dance at school tomorrow. I wish you could go to it with me. Her eyes went wide. The April Cools dance? He groaned. (sighs) It is a stupid name. I'm sorry. Do you think they would have let me go? Why wouldn't they? He asked, but he knew the answer. Oh. You have to leave soon, Hughes. Where will you go? We don't know. On an adventure, I guess. She was putting on a brave face for him. He got out his cell phone, realizing that they didn't have any photos together. You want to take a picture? Of us? Yes, very much. She too removed her phone. He put his arm around her, smiling for the cameras. And she felt like a regular girl, just one wearing a fur coat. She checked out the picture on her phone and made that little trilling laugh. Then she called up a song. It was the Beatles. Yesterday began to play. Would you dance with me, Hughes? Right now? One dance. We don't have much time. And they danced. With their bodies close together, she might have been any human girl, holding him close near the punch bowl, though she was holding his back and sides at the same time. He broke away. Can I go with you? Yeah. She made fists with all four hands. No, you can't. You have to stay here on your beautiful world and live your life. Aren't there any humans going with you? It it doesn't matter. You can't come with us. Why? I thought you loved me. I do, and it would be so easy to tell you to come. We can be together. Maybe you can think I'm pretty someday. You are pretty. No. (laughs) You need to go, Hughes. There's no joy to be had on this ship. Stay here where the birds sing and the cockroaches creep you out. 
Play in a waterfall, ski down the slopes, splash in the waves. Don't worry about me. I was born on this ship. I'm used to it. Wait, you were born on this ship? I thought you were born on your homeworld. No, Hughes. We've spent hundreds of years on this ship to get here. I just hope it won't take as long to find the next world. The unfairness of their plight hit Hughes like a punch to the gut. Oh, God. All right, it's time to go, Hughes. Don't make me be mean. You could never be mean. You either. He turned and looked toward the ramp. The last light of the setting sun gleamed through the doorway. The last sunset the Tiffany might ever see. It was just so unfair. He turned back to her, the sunlight playing off her fur as it blew in the breeze. Pretty, in a way. Goodbye. He kissed her then. He leaned in and hugged her to him and pressed his mouth to hers. It was very strange, not at all similar to kissing a human girl. He did his best to fight any shudder. The last thing he wanted Tiffany to remember was that. He backed away, and although he still had a really hard time reading Tiffany's facial expressions, he would have said that she looked stunned and ecstatic all at once. He thought he could probably get used to kissing her, if given time, but that was the one thing they didn't have. Go, Hughes. I love you. Thank you for making my last month here something to remember. She shoved him toward the exit ramp. Goodbye. She whispered in his ear as he emerged from the ship into the rays of the setting sun. The Peace Corps volunteers were waiting for him. They took him under the ship and around to the command center where the National Guard officers were keeping tabs on the masses around the fence. A countdown began, broadcast over loudspeakers to the whole area. The crowd grew more and more excited as the numbers grew closer to zero. And then the countdown ended. The ship lifted slowly from the ground and rose into the sky. The crowd cheered, yelling things like, So long, freaks! And good riddance to bad rubbish. And beginning to sing. Hughes watched the ship rise as slowly and effortlessly as a helium-filled balloon slipped out of the grasp of a child. It was nothing like the space shuttle belching fire for miles as it struggled to clear the atmosphere. Instead, it rose slowly, gracefully, like an angel. Maybe if they could have shared this bit of technological magic with humans, we would have let them stay. But they didn't even understand how their own ship worked. Hughes wiped tears from his eyes as the ship, the size of a city block, shrank from view. The people at the fence continued screaming and shouting insults until the ship was completely out of sight. Look at us. We're the ugly ones, Hughes thought. With nothing to direct their rage at any longer, the people at the fence headed off to their cars, congratulating themselves on a job well done. The news crews went back to their vans to edit and feed their stories to their stations. Hughes stood outside the door of the command center, staring up into the darkening sky, waving goodbye. A guardsman took him by the elbow. Come on, kid. You've got to go home, too. Hughes stumbled along with the guardsman until he was deposited outside the fence. His tears had dried now. It was over, and only the memories would remain. Something buzzed in his pocket. It was his phone vibrating to tell him that he'd received a text. He pushed the button, and the picture that Tiffany had taken with her phone appeared on his screen the two of them grinning, their arms reaching out towards their respective phones. Beneath the picture, Tiffany had written, Shine on till tomorrow. Let it be.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed the story. Hopefully they made it through. Long, long tail. <laughs> it, it was a long, long tail, and we can talk about that. But first, let's talk about all the talent that was involved. Uh, Clay, do you want to go with that if you've got a list? Yes. I, I think this is, if it's not the largest cast list you've had, one of the largest. Obviously, Rish and Big ran it. Rish was Hughes. Hughes Johnson. I wonder if that was a psychological little Freudian slip or not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Anthony was played by Big Anklevich, which had the probably the most entertaining scenes in the show <laughs> with his uh, Wookiee love reenactment. <laughs> or as Big's family calls it, Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany was played by the phone book lady, Renee Chambliss. Uh, we called her the phone book lady around my house because we could sit down and listen to her read the phone book. Ah, who lets? <laughs> Leah was played by Thea Killen Smith, Principal Shermer by our beloved David Robison. Mr. Other was Rich Girardi. Oh, wow. Um, Abby Hilton played Mrs. Howard, the teacher. Jay Langjans played both the stoner kid and Matthew Other. Julie Hoverson played Penny Lomquist. Joe, Z, I hope I say his name right, Zeha or Zieha. I'm not sure how to say it. We've always I just said Zija. Zija, okay. He played Hughes's brother, Zija. Uh, Gino, Mor <laughs> Zija, Gino Moretto, or I hope it, I hope I typed Moretto. I hope it's Moretto and not something else. But Gino played the reporter that you heard near the end, and the guardsman was played by Brian Lincoln. Nice, Clay. Did you not have a part? Yeah, I was the narrator, but, oh. <laughs> but I was I was reading the cast and the narrator. I I I just I started with you guys and just forgot to read my name. Whoops. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, yes, the narrator was also played by a person. Yes, it was a person. <laughs> um, music was from Incompetech.com. I believe the song name was Desperation and Triumph. Most of the special effects were from Freesound, but the producer of the show did create some of them. Nice. That, that would be me. <laughs> did you have a good time creating sound effects? What did you make? Uh, I, I made about half of the, uh, the spaceship sound at the end. And some of that was also dubbed into some of Tiffany's uh, lines, where Tiffany had her her little hums and calls and stuff that she said did. Neat. I, oh, I, I, I laid I laid some of the spaceship sound under that also. I I don't know that it was really audible, but I did it anyway. So. Okay. Uh, you know, we forgot to mention also. There's a, a few more people that actually participated in this story because when we went to. New Media Expo back, not this year, but last year, you had asked us to get a group of people singing na 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 na, hey, 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 goodbye. Okay. And so everybody that was with us at New Media Expo last year participated in making that sound effect of the crowd yelling, hey, 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 goodbye. Bye. So we also had, uh, let's see, who all was there last year? I think Abby was there, uh, Marshall was there. Scribe Harris was there, Lauren. Uh, Brian Lincoln. Brian Lincoln, but he already had. He was the guardsman, so he's been mentioned. Oh. And uh, speaking of that, so was uh, the phone book lady. <laughs> she really? was there as well as part of that crowd. So even a larger cast than originally thought. And don't forget, announcer man. That's good times. It's well, like I said, I think I think this is probably the largest cast that y'all have ever had on your show, uh, and I mean just of the characters, not 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 counting the the song, where everybody <laughs> uh, everybody pitched in. You had thirteen cast members counting counting the narration. Yeah, I think that's really cool that we can get that many people involved in it. Um, that makes for a lot of fun, and most people just got a line or two, which is generally, I guess, the way it goes. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. Yeah, a lot of a lot of them didn't have very much at all, but they were there. And without them, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been believable. Because if if one of us had done one of these other lines, it would have been very obviously one of us yeah. doing it. That's cool. So uh, now that this story is over, I suppose it's time for the author's note, which we don't really do when we write the story, but that's because we are the authors, and so the whole thing is the author's note. We have an advantage because. Clay has been doing this thing called the Concast. Yes. 
which I guess is a website that he's done where he goes to comic book conventions, fantasy conventions, porn conventions. You ever go to one of those? You know, I, I have not yet been able to get permission to go to one of those. Yet. And he does interviews with the people there, and then he posts those interviews on this website. I, and I looked through here. You've got to have 50? 50 interviews? Oh, I'm, I'm running running in the 70s right now, and I've got another 15 oh, okay. that are ready to drop. Wow. See, so you're a professional at this. And, well, uh, I don't get paid, so technically not professional. <laughs> um, but I, I do a lot. My goal is 200 interviews this year, or 200 recordings wow. this year. I, I don't know if I'm going to reach it, but that's my goal. Okay, you got a lot of interviews under your belt, sir. If we can just do this as though it was an interview, we can just ask each other questions about it. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to ask you, um, you worked on this for a dang long time. And it was a dang long story. Well, I had it in my control for a dang long time. Whether I worked on it that whole time or not, it's up, to, up for argument. I happened to say yes to several rather large projects right around, around the same time. So it kind of got buried for a little while. But when I got onto it, 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 it went pretty quick. So yeah, I did have this story for, for actually over a year. But some of it took that long. I've been mean, putting putting together thirteen people's worth of lines, and in some cases, I had to I had to go get the lines cast and and get the lines myself. That was a challenge. I've 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 done large casts before, but this is still I think the largest cast I've done. Well, we've been doing so. a lot of these triple word score stories. Like uh, oh, recently we ran one uh, that you wrote. Yeah, you ran one of mine not too long ago. And it, it was, it, except for the cat story and the telephone with, conversation with God story, most hated episode <laughs> ever on the Dune st- Is that right, Big? It's, you put my name on You put my name on it. That's the risk you run, gentlemen. It's, well, guys, I, gentlemen is kind of a broad term. <laughs> Actually, it's not quite the, 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 the least popular episode because you've written more than three stories. So those all come below that, Rish. What? Are you going to cry about it? Okay, yes. A little bit of truth to uh, brighten my mood. Thank you. <laughs> as a matter of fact, today's story will probably rise right to the top of the list as least popular story ever. Yeah, but to be fair, today's story also has my name attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, <there> what, <laughs> what I was getting at before I wasn't rudely interrupted enough was uh, we do these little triple word story stories. The, 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 word star stories those That's things we've been doing That's those good. and and invariably they're all too short but this one that you did today <laughs> was it too long no because like i said i've i've actually done a production that was almost as long before so that that wasn't the problem and and as far as the podcast goes no short stories long short stories long stories it doesn't matter as, as long as it's on there somebody's going to listen to it even if it's just me Okay. Okay. <laughs> Did that answer your question at but all? <laughs> as far as the story goes, not necessarily the the work. To, no, it wasn't too long. You think that the the story didn't just blather on? It wasn't like because sometimes like Rish will do this. He'll he'll get an audio book and he'll be listening to it and it's you know fifteen discs or whatever and he's listening to it and then somewhere around disc seven he's just like oh screw this if you guys don't end this story right away I'm I'm done. And he'll just give up on, on, on a book because it's going on for too long and, it, I don't know, it's treading water? Or a, what, what is the reason why you always wind up doing this, Rish? There tends to be a sense that I have of a story's rise and fall. You can get a lot of, uh, you know, just, okay, so the, this is probably the third act right now. Okay, the, we're in the third act. Things should be coming together. The climax should be coming soon. And then it doesn't. And I start to think, oh, I think they're just wasting time they're they're mired in extending this thing so that they can i don't know charge more for more discs and so i start getting frustrated because <laughs> i want the end to come soon and i don't know maybe our story is like that too but, but maybe at the same time you could expand the heck out of this story and start with when the alien ship first arrives and go you know make a novel of it i don't know you could but i think the way it was written was just fine with the the uh i'm gonna say flashbacks or or memories that the character had of of what things happened that, that really didn't make the story feel too long. I think those are called info dumps, actually. Yeah, not flashbacks or memories. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Exposition. None of you would be alive without my info dump. Yeah, but it was done better than some stories. You know, it, it didn't come up with the, as you know, this happened five years ago or whatever. 
And so it, it was done better than it has been done in other stories. I'll put it that way. Well, thank you, sir. As you know, Hughes... <laughs> These aliens don't look like us. <laughs> so, Rish, before we go too much further, should we do kind of t- tell about the genesis of this story and where it came from and et cetera? Yes. 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 See, I was just going to ask the exact same question. Good job, Big. Okay. So, guys, where did y'all come up with the idea for this story? Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You only have to hit me with the with the uh, with the subtle hint brick three times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it was 2011. There was a contest, and it was uh, by the Pittsburgh Parsec Science Fiction Group. I I, I don't remember. I, I remember it was called Parsec, and but not the Parsec Awards. And it was a writing contest, and you had to write a ridiculously short story. <laughs> With the premise, Last Contact. And I couldn't come up with anything because I think the the maximum word length was 2,000 words, which is, to me, ridiculously short. You start a contest on your on your podcast with the 2,000-word limit <laughs> for, the, for the entrance. I never said I wasn't a hypocrite, <laughs> but... Anyway, the, the deadline was coming up, and I, I called Big, and I was talking to him, and I said, oh, I really wanted to enter this contest, but I couldn't come up with anything. And uh, we just had this little conversation, and I said, you know, if, if, if length weren't an issue, what I would like to do is write an alien story as though John Hughes, the 80s filmmaker, were making a movie about it. So it would be set in high school. It would be set in, well, maybe not the 80s. It would, be, it would be John Hughes' last contact. And we started batting uh, ideas back and forth about what spoke to us about those John Hughes movies and the, you know, the, the realization that you love the wrong girl at the end of the story. And I got really excited about it, but I knew that this was too big for this little contest. And, and Big said, well, forget about the contest, man. Let's just write it together. Am I remembering this at, at all correctly? Um, I can't remember that, A, I don't remember that we knew the length uh, limit at the time that we came up with the idea. Maybe we did. Maybe I just didn't know it. Yeah, for some reason I remember that we finished the story after the deadline. Maybe the deadline was what it was and the length thing that we didn't. I can't, I, I, I swear I remember that we were still trying, we were still planning on putting it in to the contest. And then after we started writing it, you know, we were at, third of the way through and then we looked at the actual specs and saw that we were over the limit already for length and like the due date was like passed from like I don't know six months before so you know whatever our standard MO is for story writing contests we're always like a year late and 8,000 words over limit. Yeah I was gonna say that getting a story in on time is not your strong suit. (laughs) (laughs) And I also remember when you said we had a little conversation, I remember also that being a, a slightly different from what I I have a 45-minute drive home from work. And if I remember, I, you called me as I was leaving work that night to start talking about it, and I drove all the way home before we finished our conversation. And, man, my arm was tired from holding the phone to my ear for that long, and my ear was sweaty. But uh, not important, that detail. It's funny, too, because a lot of the names of the characters, if you look through it, they're named for John Hughes folks, if you know what I'm saying. Actors, yeah. Actors. I mean, and Hugh, that's where the name Hughes Johnson came from, is that's John Hughes backwards. Yeah, except for one or two that were thrown in there accidentally. They're all named after people that were... related to those John Hughes movies from the 80s. The, the funny one, the one that I, the, the alien, the main alien's name is Tiffany. And do you remember why her name is Tiffany? No, go ahead. It doesn't make any sense to me as to why, but I remember for some reason she's named Tiffany because Tiffany played Judy Jetson in the Jetsons cartoon. <laughs> I have no idea why. That wound up being the alien's name, though. Okay, well... How that works in with the Hughes thing. (laughs) Now we got to address a bigger issue, though. Something that I wanted to talk about, and that's why I wanted to clay in the room. I have no idea how people collaborate on a short story. 
I've never been able to make it work. I've never uh, had a successful collaboration where it was a true collaboration. When you read a whole novel and it's got two names on it, I, I don't know how they did that. We certainly tried to have this be a true collaboration where both of us participated 50% and we traded off on the story. You know, it was my turn to write and then it's his turn to write tomorrow and all that. But I don't know how people that make it work do it. Um, it's not... Yes, exactly. Whoever made that awful sound, that's how I feel about collaboration. It was the chair, man. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Well, I agree with the chair. And Big, I don't know about you. You, what, what, what are your feelings about collaboration and then this particular uh, one? You know, I don't know. I've always wondered. It. I, I, what I'd really like to see, and I, maybe somebody knows of one out there, but you know how there's always books about how to write science fiction or how to write whatever, how to be a writer, on writing, all those kind of books. They're always just like the general process of writing. It would be really cool if somebody like, you know, I don't know, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman or somebody like that who's always collaborating with somebody in their books just sat down and said, this is what we do. Here is our process. And they did a whole essay on it or, or an article or a book or whatever on how they do it. Because, yeah, we had no idea what to do. I mean, what we did, and it sort of worked and sort of didn't. We sat down, or we, I drove home, and you, I don't know, we're sitting somewhere on your phone, and we kind of hashed out generally how the story was going to go. Um, and that was our first impetus or whatever to get this thing started. And then from there, I think, if I remember right, I think I said that I was going to do character bios for the main characters, and you were going to do like a, a step outline of the, how the story was going to go, the progress of it, and then we switched them off. And I remember that already was our first problem because when you saw what I wrote for the character bios, you hated it and you wanted to quit already from there. That is not untrue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Clay, do you ever collaborate with other people in writing? Well, they... The only thing I've done is a, is an anthology that I, I just submitted a story for, which, in which some of the authors were uh, sharing a world, sharing a city, actually. But I don't know that it was true collaboration because we wrote our own stories. We just crossed over a lot of information and names and things like that. So I've really never collaborated on a story with, with another individual. I wouldn't have the first clue because my, my whole thought would be, well, who's writing the damn thing, you or me? Okay, well, I, you and I are of the same mind then. I, I just, I don't see how somebody can do half. It's just a matter of, of not having experienced it before, so I, I don't know how it should work. I, that it does work, yes, I know, um, because a lot of the big names in science fiction did it. Uh, Asimov and Silverberg did it. I don't know how, but they did. Maybe one day someone will ask me to collaborate, and we'll find out whether or not I can survive in jail. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it makes me wonder what the, what the way to do it is. You know, there, there are people that are experts at, like, analyzing writing styles and crap like that. So they can tell, you know, they, they say that there are people that can tell, oh, this is one author, this is a different author. I've heard that people read Richard Bachman's books. They're reading it and saying, boy, this sounds like it was written by Stephen King. And, you know, that was kind of how they got onto his pseudonym and discovered him as just somebody thought it sounded like Stephen King's writing enough for them to want to investigate that. And I, it makes me wonder, could somebody like that grab a book that was written by two people and be able to say, oh, this chapter or this page or whatever, oh, this was written by one of them and this other page was written by another one kind of a thing. I, I just wonder, yeah, I mean, what is the process? I wish I had some clue <laughs> I don't know there were there were parts of the story where I I, I would look at it and, and think you know I think Rish wrote this part but I couldn't I, I couldn't tell you what parts now and I, I don't even know if I would be accurate I I think you can sit down and, and read somebody's writing not knowing who it is if you're familiar with it and go oh this sounds like him or her or whatever 
mm-hmm. or read you know one story with two writers and know who did what. I don't know that I could do it, but I could understand how it could be done because Stephen King writes very di- differently from Isaac Asimov. You could you know give them the same story and they they would you'd be able to tell the difference. True, but I don't know when it comes to through a true collaboration if one would shine through, or if it would almost become a third the, the a third person you know, as a writer, if you know what I mean by that. That's right. probably the goal if in a true collaboration to create something together that you couldn't have created separately. And there are parts in this story, especially listening to your production of it, Clay, where it's just like, oh, I didn't write that part. And I'm sure you feel the same way, Big, where you're just like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, hey, that's where it really flows because that's where I came into it. <laughs> The funny thing is I listened to it and I'm just like, I didn't write any of this. Did I write this story? Wow. This... Well, I edited, I, I edited it heavily. No. <laughs> I know that I did write lots in it, but after all this time and then going back and looking at it, it just, I think it's Rish's story for some reason. It's weird. Well, I was sort of the captain of this particular vessel because, I mean, it came from my idea and it was what I wanted to do. And if you're a writer, because it's such a solitary thing, you tend to not have to compromise. And with a collaboration, it's it's got to be all about compromise. And that is hard, and it's made lots of would-be collaborations fall apart with me. And you and I have collaborated on screenwriting before. Uh, we did that... St- it was going to be a movie, uh, and then it ended up being an episode of the Dune Steve called uh, The Spirit of Christmas. Right. And I think screenwriting collaboration is easier because one person talks and the other one types and then they switch off and they rewrite the sentences and it's like, oh, this line would be better if and all that. But this wasn't like that. This was, I've I've written this scene, now you go. And instead of me writing the scene after it, I wanted to look at your scene and say, well, but if we want to get to this point, this scene has to do something different. And then the question is, do I rewrite his scene and potentially derail this collaboration? Or do I write the next scene and somehow magically make it all go where I want it to go? And and I don't know if we accomplished that big. Yeah, I can, I'm trying to remember what our rules were with the writing. I remember we had it basically where you had the story for a day. And then when at the end of the day, you had to... And then the other person had it for a day. But I thought, sad that it's been so long, that we can't... Uh, talk coherently about it but uh, as if you're never mind never mind I didn't say that <laughs> but I remember that I think we also had the liberty to be able to change a few things because I know I think I changed your intro you know the first words of the sentence you had it doing some stuff and it was doing this thing and I went in and changed it to a different to a different opening slightly uh-oh. And then I sent it back to you, and then you changed it back to where you had it to begin with. And uh, I think that's when I kind of stopped trying to uh, force things on you um, after that. But but I, I could... I don't know. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, it sounds like something I would do. I, and, and yeah, that's that's uh, that makes me a jerk. I realize that. I, I think the best collaboration would be what Brandon Sanderson does with Robert Jordan. Yeah. Dead guy. That's right. There you go. <laughs> Somebody gives you their notes on a story, and you and then it. dies, and you're fine. Yeah, but <laughs> and even then, and even then, Brandon Sanderson managed to take two books and and make it into three or something like that. So I think there's a lot more Brandon Sanderson in those last few books than there is Robert Jordan. That's possible, but I've read those last books, and I have to say that it's a good thing that he finally came on because Robert Jordan was lost. By the time he uh, got to the end of what he was writing, he had so much stuff going on that nothing happened anymore. Yeah, I think that started in book three, actually. <laughs> oh, no. And yeah, it got to be so bloated that, yeah, it was just nothing would happen. And then when finally Rob, uh, Brandon Sanderson took back over, I went, oh, wow, things are happening again. I guess I will finish this series. I think that the goal of a collaboration should be to write something together that you could never write separately. Bringing your life experience and my life experience and my attitude and your sense of humor and melding them. And so it will be like something that Clay said, where it's, it feels like a third person. And I, I don't know how that's possible. 
But if there are people in the forums or on the comments that can tell us how they've made collaboration work, I'd like to try it again. I'd like to get better at it. It would be really neat to see something and say, I could never have written that if we hadn't done it the way that we did it. Yeah. Uh, if, and Oh, go ahead. Finish. I was going to say there was one contribution that you put into it that is important and I think needs to be addressed. Uh, is is that okay, or were you about to say something? Uh, no, you that... go ahead. I don't. I don't. I'm not. I'm, I'm curious now. I don't. I put in okay. a contribution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it's the one character that doesn't have a John Hughes related name. No, uh, it's when I wrote the calling. Do you remember that story? Uh huh. Where you, it can be interpreted in a number of ways. There was no political agenda to the calling at all. But with last contact. I started out with a point of view and a, a bias, and, I, and I, I, I wanted to pound that home in this story. And I, I, it was a soapbox kind of story. And you came in and you, and you said, hey, can we make some of this a little more vague? Can we take out the, the actual names of political assholes and make it so that you can interpret it as however you want instead of just hitting people over the head with it? <laughs> and I think you you triumphed over that because we did like remove a couple of of specific this is this and that is that seagull <laughs> moment. Uh huh. the The interesting thing about this story is it there's a lot of things that could be seen as a uh, allegory to or whatever. I'm not sure if that's the right word for it, but. You know, it has shades of this or shades of that. And if you come out and say it, then it doesn't have shades of the other things anymore, which is handy when you're looking for a wider audience, I guess, because some people don't care about, you know, this issue. But this other issue, which could, you know, also be seen in the story, is really close to home for them. And so, you know, they, they, they like it a lot. I do recall that you did have some various particular names in there, and I thought, A, with a story like this set in some kind of near future, you know, how long of a shelf life do people like that have? Is, is anybody going to know that person's name or care about that person, or is that person going to be like, yeah, Merv Griffin was saying this, and then you're just like, Merv Griffin? Who the crap is Merv Griffin, you know? You know, time can pass and those things become less important, but stories can live on for a lot longer if they're uh, left a little bit more ambiguous and they can mean things to more people if they're that way. So I do recall, especially at the end, I remember when the uh, group was all gathered around the spaceship and telling them to get out and they were singing, na na, hey, hey, goodbye. In the story itself, it now just says, like, a radio talk show host or something like that was saying this. And uh, originally, that radio talk show host had a name. Hey, you leave Al Franken out of this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's good. And, and another weird thing about this story was originally, and I can't remember how bad he started out, but we wanted Hughes to be kind of an a-hole at the beginning. So that he hold on, we okay, you. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because that was you know I talked about how I'd made the character bios and then I sent them to Rish and he's immediately was like I don't think I want to do this collaboration because <laughs> when we talked you know while I was driving home and we we're envisioning the story, Rish is envisioning the story with the character he. he tends to write certain types of characters and they're usually kind of outsiders people that are not the cool guys um and then i wrote this character bio and i was thinking okay this guy has to learn a lesson in the story so he can't be an outsider already because an outsider would easily you know it wouldn't be such a big deal for this outsider to accept this other outsider so i tried to make him you know the jock that was on the basketball team that was you know cool and hip and an a-hole and all that stuff and yeah i sent it off to rish and he read that and went oh i don't like this character i don't want to do this story 
He he actually told me this once. He said he wanted the the, the main character to be like him, and instead I made the character like me. I was just thinking that very thing. It did sound that way when you described it. Well, well what did you think, Clay? Did you did, did you have any difficulty liking Hughes, especially at the beginning? No. I thought he was very believable. I actually thought Anthony was less believable than Hughes. I thought the alien Tiffany was more believable than Anthony. Okay. Because um, that, that character was written just so far over the top. And kind of portrayed over the top, but that's fine. He needed to be different than, than the other characters. But yeah, Hughes was, was just fine. With me. And as a matter of fact, having him be a jock or something like that would, would, would probably have not been a good, good way to put the story through. See, that was an interesting change that you put through, making the story different than I would have done, Big. And uh, that, that's hard to set up an, an arc. Especially as one of those movies where the bad guy has to learn a lesson and be not a bad guy. Is how bad do you have this guy be? And I think Hughes and Anthony were probably two birds of a feather who don't see any topic as taboo to make fun of, and that they were uh, the kind kind of nasty and and uh, and I don't know if that came through. That's that's the the character of Anthony is such a douche. And stays that way through the whole story. That's the important thing. He's a revolting character. And whenever he's in the story, I'm just like, wow, dude. <laughs> and and I, I'm sorry, I'm criticizing. I think you're just reacting to Big's voice. <laughs> okay, that, that, that may be. But the point was supposed to be that Hughes was that guy too. You know what I mean? They were the same kind of dude. But Hughes learns a lesson and he realizes that he was wrong and Anthony never learns anything. Right. And I don't know, Big, when you listened to it, did that come through? Or when you were writing it, was that an intentional thing or did that just happen? No, that was an intentional thing. I, I think Anthony was supposed to be like the, the foil, the, the guy that you can see. He, I don't know, holds it up to the, to the light for you or whatever. This is what Hughes was like and where he would still be had he not met Tiffany and learned to see beyond, you know, what he, he already, you know, his see outside of his world that he's in. That was kind of supposed to be the point, like the, he's the foil or whatever. I'm not sure what, if there's a literary term for it. I think that's something. See, whenever you say he's the foil, I think of a sword and I don't know why. No, wait, there were no knives in this show. But yeah, he's, he's supposed to be the opposite or not the opposite, but yeah, like what he would have been had he not changed so you can see the the major change when it gets to the end you know Hughes is upset because Tiffany's leaving and then Anthony comes out into the hallway and sits down next to him and they talk and, and Anthony is no longer with Leah anymore as well and you can see the different attitudes that they have. Anthony is the control group in the experiment. <laughs> yeah there you go he's the placebo. Maybe he is too over the top. I don't know, but I really enjoy the, that scene especially. And if I remember right, I think I actually wrote some of that scene. <laughs> I have a hard time remembering anything that I wrote to that story anymore to know what's what anymore. All I know is that I had to listen to that scene entirely too many times during editing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see, I just wonder how far we could have pushed Hughes at the beginning. Because there's that moment where he's like, he's he tries not to vomit when he's looking at the girl or realizing he's going to be with her. And it's just like, what an awful, what a subhuman thing for a character to feel. And for me, it was just like, dang, man, did I write this? Can I be that kind of person? But maybe we should have taken it further. Maybe Hughes should have started as being the ag more aggressive of the two. But I don't know, because at some point it's going to turn people off. And it's like, I don't want to read about a person like this anymore. Yeah, that is hard. Um, I just recently read a book by J.K. Rowling where I described it as if uh, she had, you know, finished the Harry, writing all the Harry Potters and then she thought, you know who didn't get a, a good enough portrayal, didn't get enough pages in those Harry Potter books was the Dursleys. I bet people want to hear more about the Dursleys. I'm going to write a whole book about the Dursleys and their lives because they're just, you know, despicable, revolting characters. And the, all the characters in this book at the start are just not likable. And it's really hard to get into the book. It took me a long time before I finally 
started to, you know, oh, this is a character that I should latch on to and root for uh, a little bit. And it took a long time before I got to that point. And it was because of that, because the characters were just, there was nobody that was likable in the group. They were all just deadly, you know. <laughs> That's a really scary sounding book. <laughs> In the end, it turned out to be a really great book, and J.K. Rowling is just a great writer, so that's not a surprise. And yeah, she she really takes it to you by the end of that book, and I, I really enjoyed it by the time it was done. But uh, yeah, it took me a long time to get into it, and often, you know, I wouldn't have gone that far. I mean, luckily, she writes well enough that I was somewhat engaged, but there have been other books where I, yeah, I just didn't care about the characters. There was nothing... They grabbed me about them. There was nothing that made me like them. And I just gave up on the book. I never finished it. I was just like, who cares? I don't care if this guy lives or dies. You know, he can die right now. As a matter of fact, stop. There, now he's dead. So, yeah, it is, it is definitely a, a danger that you run trying to make a character arc for a character where someone starts out as a douche and then turns into a good person. But I also think that a story will be much more impactful and meaningful in the end if there is that arc there. Okay, well, I, I, I feel like maybe I squelched some of that in the writing of our story and that it would have been stronger if he had been a sports guy and super handsome and square-jawed. And I apologize for that, man. I don't think so. I think it was good the way it was. If you'd, I, if you'd have made him any worse, he would have had too far to go in too short a time. You'd have had to write a much longer story for that to happen. Okay. Yeah, that's that's possibly true. I think he was he was well written. I think he's still. I mean, I, I don't. I think we talked about him playing basketball or something. So he did have some sportsness in him. That that's the lead of the Hunger Games series, right? <laughs> that's right. Clay, uh, you spent a long time with this story. What do you think of 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 the episodes you've produced? Is this up there? Is Are you proud of this one? Was the fact that it was so much longer, did it make you dislike the story? Did it make it, you grow closer to the story? Initially, once I actually got, got the story and started cracking open audio, I was like, oh my God, this is going to take a year and a half. And it, actually, it almost did. You're right on it with your estimate. As I got into the story... The characters, because I had all the vocal work from everybody, the characters actually started to become people to me, much more than they would have been just reading the story once or twice. And actually, I believe in an email I told you that usually these stories, after a while, they begin to pale and I just can't stand them. And that actually didn't happen on this one. The more I worked on it, the more I wanted to work on it to make it sound as good as it was starting to sound in my head. So I, I actually ended up enjoying the story a great deal. Whereas when I initially took the story, it was just kind of a meh, you know, yeah, I'll do it because these are friends of mine and, and I like doing the audio. But by the end of it, I enjoyed the story. Okay. Well, th thank you for all the work that you put into it. And I, yeah, I do feel bad because I've done long, I did office visit, which had to have been almost as long as this story. And yeah, it took nearly a year for me to, to do that. And we were all in the same room. And so yours has to have been a hundred times more difficult Sorry? <laughs> I didn't I did not comment. <laughs> Some of the delay was was again trying to get lines from people because they're all volunteers and so you can't just browbeat them into getting it done. You, you know, you put the request in, they say they'll do it, then you 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 have to wait a reasonable amount of time. And then uh one one person who had signed on had a bunch of stuff happen and she was unable to uh to do the lines, but that was it was 3 or 4 months into the process before I was notified of that when she had to move or something, something came up, it's unavoidable. And so I had to recast, you know, some of that was the delay and some of it was, you know, just life happens at my house, but some of it was just, it's a long story. And, and so having it for, I think it was a year and three months I had it. Some of it was quite honestly, just working on the dang story. It, it takes a while to, to do this. Cause when you're, when you're producing audio as a full cast, you go through it four, five, six, seven times. And every time you go through it, it gets faster and faster. But the first time is just a horribly, horribly long. So an hour-long production may take three or four hours on the first pass or more. It just all depends on, on how good you are and how much detail you put in. 
It's definitely a lot of work. I uh, I've done a few that have been uh, in that range. Yeah, there have been times where I feel like I just gave birth or something. I was just like, man, that much effort. Seriously? There should be a person that came out of it. <laughs> or a, deg a college degree or something. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I should, should get a promotion for putting in that much work. Except for, oh, I was doing this for free. Great. <laughs> and in my case, doing it for free for somebody else. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> At least you're doing it for yourself. Well, good. That's kind of weird because cause Rish and I wrote this story. So we're close to it, but also in a way we're not because it's been several years since we wrote it. And, you know, a lot of the stuff uh, that went into it, we've kind of forgotten, which I, it, I guess that's also like giving birth. You know, you you put in all this effort and then when it's over, you forget about the effort because otherwise you wouldn't do it again. But we put in all the effort, we, we wrote the story, but it's been such a long time that I'm, I'm kind of not, you know, like I was saying, I can't even tell what I wrote and what I didn't anymore. Clay, however, is just, you know, he's been working on it for the last year and he's just finished it just within the last, you know, few months. And he's probably as familiar with it, if not more familiar with it than Rish and I are now. It's entirely possible. <laughs> Which is kind of funny, and I, I, I've, I think I've said this with Rish before. Somebody who does an audiobook or an audio, you know, a full cast of a, of a story, I think there's probably no one, save the author himself, that actually has more connection and more knowledge, probably, of the story than the person who's done that reading. So you, you're probably that way, and you may well, I mean, now that it's been years, you probably know it better than us, which is kind of strange. So yeah, it's interesting to hear from you, Clay, at least that you liked it. <laughs> it's good to hear that because Rich and I are both sort of, I don't know if you'd say inexperienced authors, but new to putting our stuff out for people. So, uh, you know, it's nice to get a positive feedback. It, it kind of makes me want to get back out there and write some more things when I hear that other people at least liked what I wrote before. The voice actors really, really did some some good work in this story and they didn't just read the lines they they actually make bring the characters to life all i really did was just put them in order and put some music underneath it but that was one of the reasons why the, the story progressed so much in my mind is i went from all these straight lines with bloopers and and hiccups and everything and then slowly but surely all of this melded into a a, a conversation the story came together in that process for me and I think the people who listen to it fresh with the conversation already there, I think they're really going to enjoy the story. And if they don't, too bad. Because <laughs> y'all y'all, y'all wrote it, and it's out there. Now it's up to like it or not. And if they like it, great. If they don't, well, you can't please everybody. Yeah, I guess. Of course, you can always blame the producer if they don't like it. So. And that's what I plan to do. <laughs> that's a good attitude, man. Maybe it will encourage us to do more collaborations if we blame clay for any hate letters that we get yeah i actually started to mention that uh and then the conversation veered in a different direction but there was a time not too long ago when you and i were actually considering doing another collaboration we were doing you had some idea for a star trek-esque collaboration where there's people going out in spaceships and fighting and doing their thing and, uh, and I thought, oh, yeah, we could do it like this. And I told you an idea I had had for a space-related story. And you said, ah, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like your story, so no thanks. <laughs> so maybe we'll come up with something, since that one is stillborn. Something that actually uh, gets some life that we can uh, work on together. It would be fun. So one of you do the first draft, and the other one do the second draft. And then combined, you go through and edit it. So your third draft is your final draft. That is an interesting way to, to go about it. I, yeah, I'm, I, I would like to know if there's other ways to do it. You hear about a lot of people who collaborate together. And, and sometimes I've heard that like some guys are more like the idea guys. And, you know, they'll, they'll come up with the general story. And then the other guy is actually like the writer guy who sits down and writes the story and makes the characters and puts the words in the mouth. I'm that way. I can come up with great story ideas. I know that I don't have the ability to write. <laughs> Matter of fact, I've got two or three floating around my head, and they just 
pissing me off because I can't sit down and write them. I know I'm not good enough yet. Yeah, I have a little bit of that issue too. I wish I had a writer guy for me so I could say, here's the story, write it, go. You do, he's called but Rish. I don't, <laughs> Rish doesn't like my stories. I tell, here it is, go, write it. He says, yeah, that sounds like your story. Why don't you do it? I'm going to write this other one. And then I don't. Now, see, I wish I had a an ambition guy who would say, oh, it, well, if you don't write that, I'm going to. And it gets me off my duff, and I hurry and write it myself so that he doesn't take it from me. But would you? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I just need motivation. You know how it is. Deadlines are good. Pressure is good. You just need Kevin Smith sitting there behind you. Or on me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Be, I'm sitting here until you're done. You better ride faster. I can't feel my legs. <laughs> and now a word from today's sponsor. First, there was Alice in Wonderland. Then, Snow White and the Huntsman. And Maleficent. What about Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunter? Shut it and watch the trailer. The kingdom stands divided. Peace is just a word now. An empty word, no longer applicable to any corner of civilization. Factions struggle for their territory, expanding and contracting. New maps are drawn up each day. I stand in the middle, trying with ever-waning strength to keep a hold on what is mine and on my sanity. For the spider is everywhere, his web a sticky death trap stretching into the horizon. It began when I was a girl. Hello there. Oh, I didn't mean to startle you. What manner of creature might you be? The scuttling kind, the spinning kind, the kind not to be trifled with, not to be underestimated. You have so many legs. The day will come when two legs, my dear, will not seem like enough. In that time, you can either run from me or serve me. What if I choose to smash you, you vile creeping thing? Then you will regret your mistake, child. So that I won't forget this encounter. What is your name? They call me Miss Muffet. Paramount Pictures and Mandalay Entertainment present... Kate Blanchett as Madame Tuffet, Willow Smith as the Young Miss, Morgan Freeman as the Wicked Queen, Dame Maggie Smith as Great Auntie Gretchen, Alan Rickman as General Kurds, Liam Neeson as Commander Wei, Sir Michael Caine as the Spider King. Coming this holiday season, Anyway, hey, I, I think we've come to the end. I want to thank you, uh, Clay, for, for showing up on our show. And uh, do you mind giving us a, a plug about this project that you've been working on? Well, the the Concast is my attempt to, as what's the tagline, we talk to the people who inspire you. Uh, I go to co- uh, conventions, usually comic conventions here in in San Antonio area, San Antonio and Austin, in uh, Texas, for y'all who ain't here. And uh, I talk to the artists that are there, the the comic book artists, the actors, the musicians, whoever happens to be there. Um, if, they, if they'll slow down long enough to talk to me, I'll put a microphone in their hand and sit there and visit. I've met some really wonderful people, got some great interviews. A lot of people do a lot of hard work to put stuff out for us to enjoy it. And it's it's nice to uh, to be able to give them some love back, if you will, and, and let them let them talk about it and then let them, you know, say how to go get their stuff in a way that benefits them. Not not just buying their book on Amazon, but sometimes buying their book straight from them is, is better for them. Uh, it's And it's great. I, it, I get to get out of the house, meet a lot of neat people, and then come home and go back to sleep, and I don't have to deal with them anymore. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that does sound like, like good stuff. Sounds like it would be really interesting. It's kind of a way to, I guess, 
go to more conventions than you can possibly go to, I, guess, I suppose, if you get to, to listen to other people's interviews with those folks. Yeah, it's it's a nice way for people to, I don't know, get to meet people that they never get to meet, if, if, you'll, if you know what I mean. Because mm -hmm. if you can listen, if, if I happen to interview your favorite comic book artist, and you get to hear this interview live, well, live, you know, you get to hear their voice. It's not just you're reading someone typed. You don't know if they said it. You get to hear it. You know they said it. And you know how they said it. And, and I enjoy it probably as, as, as much as anybody else because I get to actually meet these people and, uh, and shake their hands and in some cases actually thank them for the, the art that they've done that, that I've enjoyed over the years, and, you know, whether it be an actor or something. Um, and that's available at theconcast.wordpress.com. And currently, everything that I've done is available up there. And as far as I know, will be for the foreseeable future before I have to start uh, dropping some of the older ones. But right now, there, there's none that are, uh, that are not available. I've been doing uh, this particular podcast for just over a year. I've been doing interviews longer, but on this podcast, it's only been about a year. Cool. Do you find that, you know, you have to, like, research somebody? You're just like, oh, okay, this guy, this guy, and this guy are going to be there. I don't really know who they are, so maybe I better figure out what they do. Or do you more go to people you already know? No, well, I, in a lot of cases, it, it, with authors or comic book artists, I, I, I may know their name and I may not have any idea who they are whatsoever. Uh, for the actors, well, if it's somebody that I'm familiar with, then I, I have an idea. And if they're not, then there's always IMDb. And I usually do a little research even on the people I'm familiar with because there's always going to be something they're in that I didn't know about. When I get a chance to ask questions, I, sometimes I like to throw in questions about their, their not, the stuff that's not their mainline work. Like, you know, if, for, and I did not get to speak with Lee Majors, but if I got to have, interview Lee Majors, I probably would not ask him about Six Million Dollar Man first just because that's what everybody talks to him about. And I, I don't want to be the same interviewer that they just talked to. And getting permission to get interviews with uh, the actors is the hard part because a lot of times you need to go through their managers and getting that information is not easy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very well guarded. Even though it's not secret information, it's really hard to get unless you want to spend money. And I don't get paid to do this, so spending money is not, is not the goal. Yeah, I hear you there. Well, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, for sure. As a matter of fact, I think there's a link in the show notes from a couple of weeks ago when your story was on uh, already, your triple word score story. But we'll have another link in the show notes for this week. And uh, yeah, you can head over there and check that out and listen and see uh, who Clay has interviewed and hear what he uh, what they had to say. Uh, there's a bunch of them up there and I've got, as, as of this recording, I've got about 15 or 20 more that are about to drop in a few days. So by the time you actually hear this episode, there should be very close to 100 interviews, if not more than 100 interviews up there. That's amazing, man. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. And, and they're short. These are commute-friendly interviews. Most of them are no more than about eight minutes. Every now and then, you, we'll get into a long conversation. I spoke with one actor for an hour and a half, um, and we just had a blast. I don't even know how much of it made to the podcast, but I, I talked to him forever and had a great time. Um, but most of them are very, very commute-friendly. You don't have to worry about stopping halfway through one to go to work and then get in the car. If you're listening on the way to work or on the bus or something, you can you can go through quite a few at one in one setting. And I like that because I'm not taking a lot of their time, but I'm still getting them I'm getting them promoted, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show with us, Clay. And normally we would thank the authors yeah. for giving us a story but those well i i will thank the authors for you no they don't <laughs> deserve it <laughs> thanks for inviting me on guys it was it's it's always a blast to to uh to work on on stuff for y'all or submit stuff to y'all i've done both um and it's now i guess i'm a triple threat because i've uh, you've you've published me you've produced i've produced for you and now i've been on the show so um i can die happy <laughs> okay I know there's a couple of people out there just been say, just die. I don't care if you're happy, but I can die happy. It's good that you're going to die happy because I've actually dispatched someone and they're on their way. So I'm glad you're happy now. <clears throat> uh, so anyways, I guess that's our show. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for listening, coming this far on our long journey with us. And uh, I hope you enjoyed our story. I'm Big Anglovich. I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Clay Duggar. 
Your mountain is waiting. Why not? So go. <laughs> The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons Attribution No Deviations License. Derivation. Derivatives? Okay. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Deriv. Derivatives. Eh, get it right. Non Commercial No Dera. Deri Why do I have der derivatives? <laughs> That's just weird. It's so stupid things on Wall Street. Yeah. No derivatives license, so you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot change for it or alter. You cannot change for it? Charge. I guess I'm dumb. I can't read it. I'm tired. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. I had no idea what to say on that. I was just throwing it out there. Say don't mess with Texas. <laughs> don't don't mess with Texas. <laughs> Y'all. Take two. You know, Rish and I wrote this story, so in a way, we're close to it. Uh, did somebody just okay, fall did, down? Did somebody just pass out? What was that? Oh, a, a plastic bag I shook. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> On my end, it didn't sound like a noise. It sounded like a body sliding down the wall onto the floor. <laughs> yeah, and then a big thump at the end. We may keep that effect. That sounded like a good effect to have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let me see if I can get my... Slowly, he slumped back. to the floor. <laughs> you said, we wrote this, so we should be close to it, but... And then slowly but surely, all of this melded into a, a, a conversation... And there goes Rish falling down again. That one wasn't me. That was me <laughs> sitting up in my chair, actually, which also did not sound like a loud noise to me, so. <laughs> um, completely derailed my train of thought. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No, that's not true. That's impossible. You can destroy the Emperor. It is your destiny. Join me and together we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. All right, let's give it a shot.